So it's Friday afternoon, 4 p.m. in Central Europe. Uh, it's Space Cafe Scotland time, and our Space Cafe Scotland by Angela Mattis will begin soon. We'd like to thank our ESA Space Solutions and the Astro Agency for the great support for our event series. And as always, we really appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. We will learn and improve based on your feedback as usual. I'm Thorsten Greening, your not your host, but your announcer today and publisher of Spacewatch Global. We are a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. And with Angela, the CEO, what during her day job, she is the CEO of the Think Tank Mass. We found a great friend and a wonderful host for our outreach in Scotland. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, the bi-weekly and daily news letters, and the Space Cafe podcast. So in our latest episodes features Martin Wiesowski, the chief futurist of SAP, and I really encourage you to listen to him. It's a wonderful conversation he and Markus Moslechner has. For all our fans of Space Cafe radios, radio content or audio content, we have new episodes with Niklas Nienertz and Günther Hasinger are out, and you find us, all our audios on the major a podcast platform just search for space cafe radio or space cafe podcast we also keep our fan shop open online for you where you can become a space veteran and if you as a corporate wants to support our work check our supporter program for for that on that note we like to thank our current supporters for their commitment to our work so if you missed any of our previous web talks we have an archive available on our website in the event section and on youtube so with that my job is done for the moment and i hand you over to your host in edinburgh today angela over to you good day all whichever time of day it is and welcome to space cafe scotland the first of 2022 and I have the great privilege and honor to, to be chatting today with Alan Thompson. Um, the title of this, of course, is uh, it's about Skyrora and it's dubbed as the Tales Launch, Space Debris and Government Affairs. Um, he's going to make it thrilling. He really, he will make it thrilling, I'm sure. <laughs> Alan, uh, Alan is very much a man with a mission um, in space in this uh, first uh, he's a man with the mission I think you're going to find out that is his mission is not just for Skyrora and it's not just for Scotland it's about helping space it's helping understand how would you go from where Britain is if you're a country in that position to what are the what are the, um, the milestones that have to be achieved and what kind of togetherness and attention to to some of the uh, the processes that need to be put in place um and other things. So if you've uh, signed up for this, you'll know what it is. Welcome, Alan. Alan. So Alan, um, give us a, just a little bit of, um, you know, who you are. How did you how did you get engaged with Skyrora, and uh, and you know, where does Skyrora's why are they in Scotland, for example? Yeah, thank you very much, Angela, and thank you, Torsten, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon and to be the first of the Space Cafe this year. <clears throat> um, yeah, so my background and how I ended up working at Skyrora, um, I've been working in international affairs and, uh, and, and development, economic development, working for a development bank, <clears throat> um, representing companies to regulators, um, uh, particularly in the, in the east of uh, Europe, um, and working around trying to make sure uh, companies develop in the right way, particularly focus on SMEs and, and this kind of engagement. Um, <clears throat> and um, in, in 2018, I actually found my way back to Edinburgh, so back to Scotland after having had uh, quite a, an extensive exposure to Eastern European markets um, and, uh, uh, and, and was looking for a new challenge. The new challenge popped up. It was quite literally, it was an invitation to, to meet Skyrora, to meet the, the founder and the, uh, and the owner of, of Skyrora and to, and, and to see uh, how it might be you know, interesting to support them with, their, with the journey that, 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 that was started in 20, uh, back in the 2017, beginning of 18 uh, by, the, by the company. Um, uh, from my point of view, 
um, the space industry at that point in in the UK represented almost like a completely blank piece of paper, or at least the the launch industry represented a blank piece of paper, um, and uh, a great challenge and a great opportunity to engage with uh, with with the authorities. Well, I suppose first of all, engage with the market, understand what's available on the market, and how to start positioning uh, the logistics service provision or the launch, uh, which was the aspiration of Skyrora. Um, and, the, and the motivation for setting up Skyroar in the first place. So um, yeah, I ended up starting with Skyroar in April of 2019, um, and uh, with a, with an aspiration to, as I said, to try to represent their uh, the, the mission, the, the the purpose of Skyroar, and put that into a context that we found in the market, and then help the market develop to to put that further back to to, to the government level, and then and then extending it further back to where I was operating back into the supranational level, um, partly because we fundamentally believe that uh, that first of all space and access to space is for the fundamental benefit of humankind, um, and that uh, first uh, in the first instance and second instance that um, that the, the only way it's going to work is by everyone doing it all together. Um, so there's a there's a fundamental need to have a collaboration, alignment, engagement, communications, etc., uh, from right from right from the very you know the the, the foundation of the company itself. Uh, and the aspirations that that means, what that means to the to, to the people in the street, to the population, not just within in Scotland, not just in in the UK, but in the world. And what is it that we're bringing to to change people's lives for the better? Um, and I think that it's that kind of um, image or perception that that uh, we sort of started articulating at uh, the beginning of my journey with Skyrora. Um, you know, how can we improve? What is it we're doing, and and what does access to space mean? Um, uh, and, 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 and that kind of direction, as I said, um, this, it was this kind of like, uh, you could say, forlorn hope on a blank piece of paper on a, an empty market um, that, that we went out to try and engage uh, with, with these stakeholders um, uh, by starting, uh, in fact, Skyrora, uh, uh, in, in the business plan when it was set up, it had a, a, a clearly set path, a quite, a, quite a useful, um, in fact, incredibly useful um, plan to go through iterations of small launch. So start by, you know, you could say glorified fireworks, one and a half meter size vehicles, and and start you could say on the on the fun side of things, um, you know, testing, see what a small small launch looks like, and then and get the the processes in place, taking it very seriously, putting the safety processes in place, and then building up to the next level, then the next vehicle up. You know uh, whether that be a, a four meter two stage vehicle uh, demonstrating again with 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 solid rocket engines, or then going on to a hybrid vehicle with uh, the, the the biliquid propellant um, and a solid, and and then eventually moving on to our our main suborbital vehicle, uh, which is the the eleven meter uh, Skylark L, which is something that we still have an ambition to launch in the very near future, um, and and then leave, leveraging that into the the main go to market vehicle, which is the Skyrora XL. Which is what we're looking to. Uh, well, the company's looking to, to 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 change the world's aspirations with potentially. Um, so so that was the yeah that's the kind of like uh, stepped approach that we've taken to the market and and the role that I was playing is how do I how, how can I support that how can I represent the engineering that goes into doing that to help unlock some of the the the. The, the roadblocks along the way. How can we how can we engage with the regulator before the regulations are written to demonstrate what this activity means? How can we you know demonstrate to government um, and to the decision makers what this means, uh, and then put this back into the context of a potential commercial market going forward? So yeah, you could say quite a quite a big thing. Sorry, Angela. Yes, question. It's a chunk. That's a chunk of stuff. <laughs> You said something, let me go back. I wanted to pause you and then we'll come back to, because I think the first piece we want to talk about is startup company, tech startup, and needs a government affairs person more than anything else. Well, not engineers, but, you know, an important, a really important role. Um, and then, you know, what does that really entitle, entitle? But you mentioned the Skylark, you said on passing, and it might be good, to, knowledgeable to you, but, you know, we want to change... We want to change access to space through Skylark. Can you explain that? Not everybody's going to be au fait with, with what your plans are there, what you're proposing to the space, the space environment. 
So certainly, yes, Skyro's mission is to uh, basically, well, our strategic vision is, is to try to deliver what we're, we're calling space as a service. So that is not just a logistics service provision, not just launching satellites into low Earth orbit, but also incorporating into that a platform which is part of the launch vehicle so that we can have a sustainable presence in space, whether that's, again, delivering the last mile of the satellites to their specific orbits or whether that's providing, again, onward uh, engineering or maintenance support to those satellites, to those constellations. So um, again, it's so it's not just the launch, it's not just the, this, the, as I said, the logistics service provision, it's not just putting the satellites into the, the, the transport and getting them up there. It's actually taking care about what they do when they get there and a bit more support and a bit more, uh, um, uh, yeah, what, what, well, the refueling the, and the deorbiting, so the responsibility and extending that responsibility at the end of life of, of satellites as well. So there's there's that angle to it, yes. So that that's the the clearly defined, articulated vision of Skyrora. Um, in terms of uh, the Skylark, we we just named our suborbital vehicle um, in the fashion that was known uh, again in in part of the programs. Uh, that the UK had back it 50 years ago uh, with the Black Arrow rockets, which was the inspiration that we've taken as a company, particularly for the for the the, the bioliquid propellant uh, solution, so propulsion, taking high high test peroxide and mixing it with kerosene as the fuel, as the main reason, as the main um, yeah focus for the for for how we're planning to 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 power our vehicles into into space, so um, and yeah. Pause, 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 please. Pause. I mean, there's loads of stuff and I don't want to, I don't want to stop you, but, but when you say that and you're, so you're talking basically about cycle analysis and a responsibility throughout the life cycle of your products and services, all the way from, you know, everything you use to, that goes into it, um, to its activity in space and its return to earth in its environmentally if you like it's sustainable helpful certainly you know you're doing your best can you can you dig a bit into that i think people will be interested to hear hear what you know what sure, your strategies are. definitely i think we 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 as a as a company believe that we need to be doing this responsibility thing a bit better or at least a bit better than has been demonstrated by uh, space companies particularly in 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 the us um, because we feel that, again, by having a closer relationship with our ultimate stakeholders, i.e. humankind, the people in the street, and, 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 and trying to be accountable to them, we felt that we need to recreate in our business practices, incorporate this angle of responsibility. And responsibility, what do we mean by that? It means actually trying to do it better than was done previously, whether that's, again, with a commitment to the environmental side of things, whether that's with a commitment to the sustainability side of things, whether that's commitment to gender diversity, we need to do better. We need to do better in ev absolutely everything we do, not just in continuous improvement in our engineering and our innovative solutions, but absolute, in, in absolutely every single aspect of the company, you know, how can we do better? And how can we, how can we take that measuring stick and apply it to ourselves in the first instance? And then once we've applied it to ourselves, how can we then apply that to our stakeholders, our, our colleagues, our partners, and then build, the, build this responsibility case back to government to try and demonstrate that actually we can do better and be very clear in, 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 in articulating that ambition. Sorry. Okay, so your choice of prop propellant there, because you know some of us aren't chemical engineers and don't understand propulsion. Um, and even those that might have worked in propulsion might not know very much about propulsion. I talk about myself. Um, so your choice of propulsion, does that is that is that coherent with this sustainable view? Why why did you choose why are you why are you citing that as an example of innovation? So yes, the the combination of high test peroxide and kerosene was a solution pioneered by the UK. Um, again, back in the in the 60s and 70s, when the space waste was still very uh, not just a, a two name. not just the Soviet Union and the US, but actually, and at that time, the UK scientists pioneered the combination of hydrogen peroxide as the oxidizer. 
and uh, a kerosene, uh, basically kerosene, the, ro the rocket propellant, uh, which is the main the main source of the propulsion. Um, the, the way it works is quite simple: is that you you pressurize hydrogen peroxide to approximately 300 bar of pressure. You force it through a silver catalytic converter, which takes the hydrogen off, and again at 300 bar of pressure leaves oxygen at 600 degrees in the combustion chamber, which naturally combusts with the kerosene. So you don't require a, an igniter plug or spark plug or anything like that to, have the, to, to allow the combustion to take place. Um, and uh, from that point of view, again, if you are witnessing a, an engine test that we do with, with this combination, if, um, if it doesn't combust, so if we don't achieve the right correct pressure, what effect effectively is coming out of the, 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 the engine itself is a liquid. And the liquid doesn't look to be, well, yeah, it's harmful in, in terms of its toxicity, but because it's a liquid, um, uh, adding water to this will, look, will uh, dilute it down and make it uh, you know, harmless quite quickly. But yes, yeah, so the perception is that in the first instance, so this, this fuel type, uh, high, use, utilizing hydrogen peroxide, um, uh, the, the opportunities are for the current circumstances with regards to the environmental side of things, uh, because the, the, it's just the sheer proportion that is being used. We are utilizing six parts of hydrogen peroxide to one part of, of rocket propellant of kerosene, uh, sorry, rocket propellant grade kerosene. Um, and because of that, we're actually uh, burning less hydrocarbons. So uh, per, per pound of thrust yeah. uh, that we managed to achieve and in our launch, we are therefore delivering less CO2 emissions per pound of thrust that we are creating. Um, and that, again, I suppose, is that we believe it's a useful starting point or a relatively useful argument in, again, on, on the CO2 emission side of things. Now, again, we have attempted to verify, you know, what essentially the CO2 pollution, you could say, or the, the, the impact of a uh, CO2 impact of a, a standard launch could be in the US. And yes, the, the general statement I think we got back coming from a NASA scientist was that on the whole CO2 is quite is quite small it's quite negligible and for it to have a significant effect you need to see an uplift of approximately uh, uh, up to a hundred times launches taking place now we believe all right in the bigger scheme of things if we can start by reducing that and then can with the continuous improvement in mind we can continue to reduce it we think that actually what we've got is a useful starting point let's put it that way the other benefits of the hydrogen peroxide are that it is all we need to do is to pressurize it. We do not require it in liquid form as, for example, the liquid oxygen, which is utilized by most other rockets in the US today uh, as the oxidizer. We do not require it in liquid form. Therefore, there is no power required at the launch pad to keep the hydrogen peroxide in its, in its liquid form. Yes, we require power to pressurize it. Um, but it's not as much power to keep it uh, as it would be to keep a, 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 a you know the, the 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 oxygen in liquid form, um, and for that reason we think that again it's slightly it's optimized on that angle. At the same time, if we miss the launch window, so if the weather as it has done today has, has <laughs> pulled the, the rug from underneath our feet uh, with with uh, storms etc., um, we. We do not need, so there is not an explosive risk of the hydrogen peroxide remaining in the launch vehicle on the launch pad, which, which would necessitate an immediate defueling of the launch vehicle. So um, for that reason, we think that, our, again, our solution is slightly, you could say, less explosive risk, therefore slightly more sustainable. And, uh, and actually, we could theoretically leave the vehicle uh, fueled up on the launch pad uh, for a period of time so that we can actually then take advantage as soon as the weather clears up to have a what we're calling a responsive launch. So a, a launch that will, again, take, take absolute maximum use of the available time and weather conditions um, uh, that, 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 that come good. So, so that's another feature of the... So, so, no, sorry. sorry, there's a there's a lag. I think it's got to do with the weather. I really do. I think there's something going on where we're all... Uh, where we are in the middle we're in between two storms here in the in the United Kingdom, aren't we? Um, so CO2 is an interesting topic. So when you say, you know, as a startup, because it looks like there's a lot of 
Well, tell us about that. I mean, clean sheet of paper going from not being a launch nation, a company like Skyrora trying to come in with, you know, as you said, setting those standards. That sounds like an opportunity. But at the same time, it's fraught with all kinds of difficulty, right? Because you're having to educate, you're having to take people along. So, you know, you're you were saying that uh, why does a tech startup company need to have someone as seasoned as yourself in having a dialogue with all levels of uh, at government and um, and sort of, you know, ministerial and space agency level. So give us a bit of what your what your what your day job is there and, and, and the objective, you know, what, what what have you gone to and where what still needs to happen? You, over to you. You'll talk eloquently about this. Thank you. No, there's, you're right. There's an, in, there's an incredible lot of stuff that needs to be done. <laughs> and yes, it's, uh, yeah, and it's all at once, as you're quite right. Um, why does it need to be done? So yes, the, the aim that we're trying to achieve in the first instance is to achieve a, a regular commercial launch from the UK, from the, the spaceports uh, that are being planned and built at the moment uh, in the north of Scotland. Um, we believe that obviously the, the Shetland spaceport is the best positioned um, in terms of access to polar orbits, and that is the market that we're looking to address for our satellite customers in the first instance, which is firing satellites uh, from, from pole to pole, providing Earth observation data, providing whatever it is, the, the, the constellations, the telecommunications networks, the IoT networks, etc. So, so yeah, that, that's, the, that's the clear commercial aim in the short term. Um, as you said, wh why do we require, why does such a new tech startup require uh, someone who's, who's, who's able to represent this, rep uh, this mission, this, this opportunity to government? Um, uh, basically, because as we said, when we started, uh, there has not been any regulation in place. So in spite of the fact that the UK did have a launch capability in 1971. It discontinued this launch capability. Um, it, even then that launch capability, so the Black Arrow, which was the name of the rocket that was fired, it was fired from Australia. So the UK had this wonderful attitude that we can probably do this with some of our partner nations and we, we don't need to take necessarily um, uh, uh, address the risk aspect of doing this and then try to understand it or ingest it. Um, but at the same time, with the risk side of things, it doesn't really, it hasn't really latched on to the opportunity side of things, which is what space manufacturing is all about. So the, the launch vehicle manufacturing that we're trying to represent. So it's trying to push the arguments of both what, what getting to orbit, getting to space means in the first instance, why we need the regulations, and at the same time, what that will mean in terms of, and, and, and we do honestly believe this, economic transformation. We do believe that um, what we are doing, we are filling a gap in the space value chain in the UK, which is launch. We, we, do, we do space data incredibly well. We do small satellite manufacturing incredibly well. I would say that we don't shout enough about the fact that we are world leaders in the manufacturing of satellites. Uh, we do them quite, I suppose you could say, boutiquely. We're not into the mass manufacturing of them, but we do an incredibly good job as a country in terms of, of, of those the space manufacturing and the, the, the technology that is up there already. Um, I, and I think um, what we are, what we as a company, what we as I think the opportunity for the, the country is very much to address that, that gap in the value chain. And by addressing that gap in the value chain, we achieve a knock on effect of value into satellite manufacture, a knock, of, uh, knock on effect of value into uh, capture of data or you know, of, a diversity of markets. We can actually take the next step in a shorter space of time to deliver a new data set for, um, and, and again, one of the main, I'm sure it won't surprise you, but one of the main um, stakeholders, one of the main participants in the existing space value chain in the UK today are the environmental agencies. And they recognize that. They, they capture, they, they uh, I suppose, use um, a huge amount of space data upon which to, not just to, to base their prognosis, their forecast, but also how to come up with best mitigation for for weather effects, for you know, for the change, the effects of climate change, etc. So, so we believe that by having a 
a domestic launch capability, a sovereign launch capability, which is aligned and attuned to the demand creators, such as the environmental agencies, we can actually do this ourselves much quicker, much more efficiently, and much and and by you know at, at the same time creating jobs, facilitating economic development, and really bringing the benefits of having access to space to the population of the country in which we're in. So you know the, 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 and actually being able to turn around to the the people in the street and saying, well, we improved your life by giving you access to space. That means you can now. Uh, some of the solutions that we have already, you know, the consumer solutions like taking a, a selfie from space, which is one of the ones that I know we know quite well. There's a company in, in Glasgow called Spelfi. Um, but, you know, other, other new uh, potential solutions, not just the GPS, not just the banking transactions, etc., but a whole new host of, of, of space opportunity around data capture. And then the next level, which is even, you know, I think that, again, colleagues in, in SSTL, in particular, Sir Martin Sweeting's coining next space, which is in orbit everything. So in orbit manufacture, in orbit testing R&D in orbit and that's the next so, one. So, so, yeah. so there's actually a question there from Mark Mayer, which was saying, how can we build a multinational on, on the in orbit, um, in orbit service network, including debris recycling in space? That's one question. Um, uh, there's another question, but it's relating to fragments of when you come back in, but that's different. I mean, I want to say something which is, I mean, selfies in space yes you know i'm not really the self a lot of people are not maybe i'm not i'm just not the selfie generation um i don't think i've i think i don't think i've ever done one uh, but you know we we are also in scotland we're you know we have the sustainable space um grouping within space scotland and we are talking about you know we had a session on earth observation and the importance of earth observation if we don't preserve we don't uh, improve the management of, of objects that we put into space, uh, then we are putting in danger Earth observation capability. And that is, you know, yes, it's about banking and yes, it's about communications, but it's about Earth observation and allowing us to manage our behaviours and, you know, the, how we are stretching our use of resources on Earth, water, what's happening with soil erosion, what's happening with, um, you know, fire, storms, uh, you know, weather, all sorts of things to, to manage on earth. And, and I always give this example of, you know, I, I worked for ICI, Imperial Chemical Industries. People have heard this. I'm sorry if you've heard it before. But, you know, um, we were working, it was a poly, polyurethanes division. And I would never say the word polyurethane because we actually created, I worked with a, a brilliant French chemical engineer who was given the job to create a patent, well, to create the technology that would remove chlorofluorocarbons from polyurethane manufacture. And he did, he's the guy who was, uh, did the patent. But that, that, whole, that whole momentum in industry only happened because NASA could observe, observe the ozone layer. They were, we were saying like the, you know, and again, um, I participated recently on a Space Watch Global, the Maria Buzzvox Populi, um, please look up, sort of talking about, um, um, you know, don't look up. And there were two scientists that were kind of going on about this gap in the ozone hole, right? I mean, they were, they were just exactly like the two scientists that went to, to, to uh, the White House to kind of put their case for this um, in the movie. Uh, and it was, it was only because of Earth observation that we were, it, the proof was laid before the company that was manufacturing this, and they they were true to their word. They shut down. Um, they shut down their, their manufacture of that. It was triggered by um, and the the, the connection because you're talking about the connection to the man in the street. And I think this is space observation is about managing the planet, is about managing CO two, is about understanding what we're doing on, you know, peat bogs and observe, you know, and and the permafrost and the melting ice caps and all those things, Alan. So, you know, yes, selfies are great, but I think there's, a, there's something that I think in many beating hearts, if you'll, if you'll allow me just to butt in there with my, my quite strong opinions on that. <laughs> no, I completely agree. I think, yeah, the, the one thing I wanted to mention about on the environmental side of things as well, so Skyrora has also developed its own uh, proprietary 
sort of eco-friendly fuel, we call it ecocene. And we've taken unrecyclable plastic from landfill and turning it into pellets and then through pyrolysis, turning it back into rocket propellant grade uh, kerosene. Um, and that, that is, while it's a very simple, you could say relatively simple process, um, actually having that combined with, uh, with the HTP, the high test peroxide, we believe again is, is a, a nice reinforcement. So actually we're taking plastic out of the ground and trying to use it as the kerosene. Yes, it still has hydrocarbons in it. Yes, there still will be CO2, but again, we're, we're basically trying to put it for, uh, to good use Otherwise, it's just as waste in the, in the land or in the oceans. So that's one angle. But to take it back to your 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 bigger statement there, I think your so uh, and the and the and the reason for having a government affairs uh, or, or a public affairs facility or or capability in in such a small company is precisely because and and as the question sort of insinuates as well is because the as we started the, the space agenda is really quite literally uh, limitless. So. Um, I think that um, the, the, the UK has a unique opportunity, uh, particularly in space, a unique strategic opportunity with the space, uh, with the space uh, it, uh, as it stands today, with uh, a great capability in the area of diplomacy and uh, space law, uh, with the International Institute of Space Lawyers, I think, being located in the UK and very much being bolstered by UK space lawyers. Um, I think we've got what we do again, uh, the, the, the nature, if we grab hold of this opportunity correctly and as one, uh, we can really, as I said, quite literally transform, transform our society uh, into a much better economically driven opportunity, again, around space manufacturing, which is, again, incorporating all of these responsible elements into that activity, providing new jobs, sustainable, you know, uh, new, new sustainable lines of work for, uh, for people who want to go into space, into space engineering, into in-orbit in manufacturing, etc. And yet, at the same time, um, um, as I said, th this is something, this would be how the UK can then demonstrate if, if, it, if we can fulfill this gap in terms of launch, we then have a much stronger offering to be able to insert ourselves into the, 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 the international efforts to support the removal or the resolution of the issues around space debris, to be able to suggest or come up with uh, again, soft regulation or or norms that we would want to propagate. Um, so again, this is something that that Skyrora has been uh, and, and I've been involved in on behalf of Skyrora is to try to attune and to align ourselves to these 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 areas of activity, particularly to the long term sustainability goals as articulated by the UN Office of Outer Space Awareness. And how does that work? How does it, what does it mean? You know, how can we actually apply these to ourselves and what will it mean in terms of our offering, not just to, uh, well, to society, to the man in the street, but also to governments. And how do we push that line of responsibility back from the very top of the strategic pyramid, from diplomacy, from legal, back all the way down into manufacturing, which is what we're talking about and very interested in. So I think, you know, the totality of that opportunity is incredibly compelling. And I feel that at the moment, while uh, Her Majesty's government has articulated that they are interested in launch, it very much feels like um, it's been an articulation that that, that happened uh, maybe for one reason or another, but the, but it hasn't been followed through on for whatever reason. So there was this, oh yeah, launch, it looks like a good opportunity. And yes, there was, I think there was a specific uh, one person to whom it could be attributed in the cabinet office where, where there was this idea, why can't we do it through the prism of space or absolutely everything through the prism of space. I know that that person is now longer in the cabinet office and there's a bit of a vacuum, but, but what's happened is that now, um, the, the space in general in, in UK government and Her Majesty's government is very disparate. It's all over the place. We've got it in the environmental aspects. We've got it in the defense side of things. We've got it in Skynet. We've got it in, you know, um, uh, we've even got it in insurance and risk adjusting. You know, we've got it. We've got the capability to 
to, to help insurers risk adjust, you know, the loss of head of cattle in Mongolia or something like this. And this is a solution that we've developed as an industry in the UK, which is quite remarkable. But what we don't have is a the, the totality of the vision, bringing all of those strands together, packing it together, and then sticking it up there at the top and saying, well, so what are our strategic capabilities? How do we align industry to those strategic capabilities? And let, let's do the business bit. Let's, where are the smart, measured, achievable, relevant, and time, time related actions, deliverables, so that we can actually demonstrate that we can do this properly, not just do it, uh, not just do it for ourselves, but do it for the whole benefit of, of the industry, not just for the UK, but for the benefit of the, the whole space industry globally as well. And that I think is also witnessed by your engagement in the discussions that you had, again, um, well, with, with Murray Jars, um, Vox Populi around the, the, the space traffic management side of things. How, how is that going to work? Again, there's an initiative that Skyrora took that we started to call, well, the, the idea was around uh, we called it Finding Prospero, and as many of you probably will know, was uh, locating the satellite that the Black Arrow uh, rocket launched in 1971. Why, why, why would we want to care about Prospero? Well, partly because Prospero was a satellite that was launched in 1971. It's still up there. It's no longer operating or fulfilling its original mission. Um, it could be designated as space junk. We are not insinuating that it should be designated as space junk because we've been challenged that it should actually be regarded to as space heritage. But yes. these are precisely the discussions we need to have. We as a society need to sit down. We as an industry involving all of the stakeholders, the, the astronomers, you know, and, and the regular population, we need to involve them in these discussions and explain to them why this is important to have a better handle on, why we need to be doing this better, why we need to be, you mentioned in the, you know, the holes in the ozone layer. So on, on the back of the Finding Prospero idea and this challenge, we wanted to use this challenge to try to identify the known unknowns and then also go into the unknown unknowns. What do I mean by that? I mean, by challenging ourselves to recapture, to capture a piece of uh, a satellite that was launched 50 years ago and to, and to understand that, yes, whether it's space heritage or not, if it's space heritage, who do we have to ask permission to recover it back to the UK? And, and can we put it into the Science Museum as a, as a piece of heritage so that we can all pay you know, the museum to go and visit it, and understand it and see what the effects of space have had on it? Um, you know, but also how can we use it as, a, as an example for to learn the lessons that we don't know yet? So again, what is the what is the inclination? What is the orbit of, of Prospero? Um, you know, how are we going to physically design a capability to capture it? How are we going to deal with the fact that it's tumbling? How are we going to, you know, these kind of issues? And then also how are we going to even start beginning to broach the subject of bringing it back down to Earth in one piece rather than letting it burn up in the atmosphere? One of the, the elements that, that triggered this 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 from uh, this comment from my side was also you mentioned the the holes in the ozone layer. One of the questions that was challenged to us as part of this discussion so far has been um, when when people are talking about space debris and capturing defunct satellites, there is this perception at the moment that you just dump the satellite to burn up in the in the atmosphere. Surely, you know, by by mere uh, uh, function of the fact that you are burning something up in the atmosphere, there will be emissions. What do these emissions mean? How is that going to affect the ozone layer? These are questions that we as a, an industry cannot answer yet today. We, I feel, again, taking this, this aspect of responsibility forward, we need to be able to answer these questions for ourselves, the industry itself, in the first instance, if not, then we are not going to be seen to perceived to be credible when we are trying to engage with the general public to say that we know what we're doing. So a lot of a lot of the the aspirations behind the the articulation of this uh, uh, finding Prospero challenge was to be able to start having those discussions in the context of this is what we think we can do. And yes, there are other, plenty other companies around the UK where we can start solving these problems, such as Space Forge in Wales, 
who is designing a technology to be able to bring things back through the, the you know the burning up of the ozone layer or the atmosphere etc so that we can actually recover them back down to earth um, you know and then there's the next questions the so it's the known unknowns then it's the unknown unknowns which are include the, the challenge that was made of, of Starlink of the the environmental impact assessment of putting satellites in space in the first instance how do we answer that question you know how do we go about coming coming up with an algorithm to be able to do that and and one just for for completion of thought on this sorry just very quickly the prospero challenge we then took into the prospero principles it was a great uh, suggestion that we had again as a suggestion for a set of norms that the UK could sign up to as a new launch nation to try and impose or impress upon satellite manufacturers to demonstrate their commitment to that responsibility. So if we say we are being responsible as a launch, as a new launch nation, this is the set of Prospero principles. We want you, satellite manufacturer, to sign up to the to this transparency about how you know your transparency of your trajectory, what you're planning to do with your satellite up there, you know, and that we can then, on the basis of this, start to put some norms in place to allow us to better manage what's going on up there. So these are these are some of the things that we spend a lot of time, as you can hear as well, and, and you know, passion. Let's put it in, into <laughs> into developing and trying to push these conversations further. At the same time, yeah, the purpose of this is to to drive the attention of what this really means, what this activity of gaining access to to space from the UK means. To, to use it as a vehicle to extend our responsibility, but also to extend our ambition and say we can do this an awful lot better. And we can do this and we can be proud of how we do this better. So, sorry. No, no, no apologies. I think everybody who's listening, I mean, we've got, we've got uh, um, folks from Inovo in Switzerland, we've got people from Tokyo, people from Brazil, you know, all over, sorry if I've missed a country, Germany, uh, etc. Uh, you know, people listening in and keen to hear what you're saying, and you really have covered a spectrum. You know, there's a question which has come in from Roderick as well, which is, and I think you've sort of touched on it, will the space tugs deorbit with space fragments as well as whole satellites? Well, I think you were talking about Prospero. That's what that was about. Do you even want something to burn up? Do you want to keep that Prospero? Do you want to keep it, bring it down and put it in a museum? rather than have it burn and get damaged at all um, but maybe you've got some answers to that uh, so I think I think yes in um, terms of the space Elise, to be, maybe we that in. Sorry. sorry yeah we can't not talk about fragments we can't not talk about we have to talk about the totality of it I think yes in the first instance there is there's a lot of increasing attention to this area precisely because of the actions that have, have ended up in the press, whether that's anti-satellite uh, activity or, uh, and, uh, you know, it, or whether that's accidental collisions that have taken place. Um, I think we, we, again, because we are still um, beginning to learn how to talk about this, we obviously need to include everything. We can't exclude anything. Um, but at the same time, you know, let, let's say that the, the, the what is it, the, the driver of change is, is uh, what do you call it, uh, laziness, yeah? We want to try and do this as efficiently as possible, and that will drive change. How can we do it as efficiently as possible? And we start by uh, focusing on, again, and, and one of the things that we believe Skyrora has built in with this vertical integral, with, with the integrated solution, the platform plus the, the launcher, is that we have a solution to support constant installations, not just to deploy, but also to, uh, so if we have, for example, a, 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 a space tug attached to a specific constellation, we can then, while the, in the downtime that the space tug is not fulfilling a, a specific mandate for the constellation, we can actually utilize the downtime to remove some of that debris. So this is again beginning to try to answer some of the questions around who's going to pay for cleaning up space. Um, so, you know, these are kind of practical solutions driven out of discussion and driven out of trying to uh, trying to understand the problem a bit better and also to measure the problem a bit better. I think, measure. again, one of the fundamentals that I think we're, we're all very much uh, uh, clear about and something that I know Mariba very, is very, very active on is 
uh, you know, let's not get hysterical, let's measure it, let's understand it better. And how were we measuring it? Um, I think the other thing that uh, I would also note in particular is there was a there was a, a really great statement by Professor Hugh Lewis, I think of Southampton, who said, "How can we be nostalgic about tomorrow's space? How can we be be uh, you know that the emotion of nostalgia, which is something that is represents a, an attachment or an emotional attachment to an issue, but how can we recreate that emotional attachment to allow us to motivate you know to actually be much more clear-headed about how we go about measuring the size of the problem, uh, you know, getting better information about it, and then start solving this problem. I think, yeah, part of the challenge is that we're getting, it's very easy to get to his hysteria quite quickly, uh, and yet at the same time, without necessarily fully understanding the total resources that we as an industry, as a country can deploy to be able to solve these problems. One of the great things just on that point in terms of the resources, one of the great analogies that I've come across in, in Skyrora's activity, we've been talking to um, the, the, the Marine Centre for Science and Technology um, uh, in, in Scotland, MASTS, uh, and indeed, there's one uh, there's one simulator in St Andrews University which spends a lot of time mapping the coastline uh, of the UK, the marine coastline, and understanding where the wrecks are and what the pollution has been in the oceans. Now, guess what? They're involved in wreck recovery. Of course, they have remote operating vehicles capturing data about wrecks and what it is, what their impact on that environment is. So again. Does it sound, sound familiar? Of course it does. It's just that the oceans are probably just as, as unmapped as the space, yes. <laughs> the, the, you know, the heavens are. But, but no, there are capabilities that are already enacted at the moment at the bottom of the sea that we in the UK have. Where is the, why, where, who are the, you know, where's the opportunity? There's a huge opportunity in aligning those resources and deploying that capability into a new environment, into space. And that's what I'm talking about. That's why there, it's a really massive opportunity it's just aligning what we've got and making it work better and I think that is what the you know is the really driving excitement from my point of view wow yes so when you say a man with a mission that's a big mission and there's lots of moving parts to it and you're right in the thick of it it's sort of it's quite a privileged position actually to be to be doing that link but with um what I would say is is an all-encompassing I mean you really have you haven't really left any stone unturned there, Alan. I think everybody's going to be really, um, uh, you know, quite delighted at your at your view on that. Now, Elise is asking something quite fundamental, and she sort of p p she's posed it uh, twice, and it's sort of what were the breakthroughs that were needed to design and manufacture affordable micro satellite launchers dedicated to launching payloads, of small satellites. And then she also asked, and what were the factors that motivated Skyrora to adopt its design and technologies to make these small satellites? So why, why, why go into the small payload into the small satellite so, market rather than she says, you know, rather than the, the high maturity proven technology and the heavy lifting um, um, capabilities that already existed? I think we we as a company wanted to be much more of a bespoke solution provider. And yes, the, the concept of having a taxi service uh, was the one that we wanted to, to, to perfect. And as I said, now with the inclusion of this, so the taxi service is the delivery to the actual front door, uh, the actual specific um, uh, 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 address orbit of the satellite where they need to be and and having that and having that capability in terms of the third stage uh, uh, again the next the next logical onward step was actually to say well once we're there it's not that difficult for us to remain there the third stage and actually to undertake some additional functions so so in, in terms of the you know the the, the, the design we were looking for a, a boutique slightly you know uh, more niche uh, area we, we we as a company thought that this was better fitting to the the slightly more niche products in terms of the satellites that are being manufactured in the UK and slightly more specific uh, uh, again um, uh, sensitivity to a value proposal of such types so that we can actually be integrated into some of the, the again the, the slightly more nuanced payloads uh, that, that exist out there that are being developed in the UK and actually by by being slightly more tailored to them that that's the way we wanted to position ourselves in the first instance as i said one of the really big 
opportunities that this currently represents is that we could actually change the paradigm about how we charge for space rather than rather than necessarily per price per kilogram on, on launch we, we're looking at the possibility of charging per year on orbit or per however many hours on orbit which would include or price in the launch into that hour you know or whatever that could be um so so that we are not being dragged into a price war per kilogram of launch with the large bus services that exist in the US and actually be allowed also the other angle is be allowed to compete on our environmental credentials so you know we believe that if we can deliver less carbon emissions why can't we swap that out in terms of a, a carbon credit or something like that again vis-a-vis -vis the you know let's let's be rewarded for wanting to be slightly more responsible in our approach to launch at least environmentally responsible. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the breakthroughs, yeah, I suppose you could say that the, the combination of the hydrogen peroxide and the, the kerosene, which is quite an element, as I said, it's been around for a long time. It's just the circumstance that we find ourselves in that has made this even more appropriate. And that I think is quite an interesting one. I, again, it's a quintessentially British solution. It was one that was pioneered by British technologists back in, again, 50 years ago. Well, uh, and the other, the other great thing about this is gonna sound really weird this but um uh the the inverted argument that this gives us actually those scientists out there there you obviously know this but the 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 isp the the unique impulse of the engine is less so actually the power you get from using hydrogen peroxide and uh, kerosene is less that means what does that mean that that means that it's more like a limousine when you're taking off it's not it's it's a very slow start and if you if you watch the black arrow launch video on youtube you can see that it sort of hovers in in the air quite for quite a long time before it finally you know i mean after you know after ignition it takes a very long time to build the thrust up to actually start uh, making its way forward um, that's the limousine start actually that also means that there's less g-force exerted onto the satellites themselves during launch and wait for it yes this is the tailored piece um, that, that the satellite manufacturers, as I'm sure you're aware, are all uh, heavily over-engineered to deal with the 10 G-force or the 10 G or 8 G that is on the bus service in the US. We believe that by having a, a 4 G service with our taxi, our limousine, actually we can help we can help it save some of the cost for the satellite manufacturers in their over-engineering because there's less uh, force being exerted on the satellites and therefore we can actually help the satellites become more effective or more efficient in their data capture so the the devices that they could have on board can be more sensitive let's just put it like that and, and so i know our com yeah 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 no that is that's amazing and thank you that i wondered when the, the uh, black arrow thing was uh, when you were going to bring that in and it's still i wasn't aware of that that was really fascinating and we as a company, Think Tank Maths, we actually worked on the testing rig, you know, how to how to get a, um, a system that would homogenize all those parts for the insurance for people to launch their satellites for survivability and, and you know, in, at ESA and um, on our website, if anybody wants to look at it. But it was all about that. How do you survive the G-forces? So they literally had to simulate, will this thing go up after it's gone through those G-forces and how much life and, and what is its uh, integrity when it gets there? I like the idea of a limousine and, and what was going through my head is, you know, we talk about pop, kind of the whole pop culture, you know, it reminds me of kind of Joe 90 stuff. Maybe I'm giving my age away here. You know, they sort of go up and they hovered and then whoosh, they took off. Okay. That's maybe I've always been a geek girl, even when I was, uh, when I was at high school. <laughs> yeah. Now that, that, that is, that is, that's beautiful. That's very, very together. I'm trying to see, um, I'm trying to see if there are other, other questions before we come to, I mean, because I, I want to get some, the, maybe other questions people might just want to add, add, add talk, because you've done the black adder, you've done the bit about, you know, what are the USPs of the UK? <sighs> Jeez, you know, and I'm going to say this, we even had a session this week as the, uh, the Scottish um, um, Sustainable Space Group, um, and I mentioned on um, Earth Observation, we need to map everybody. This is new market. There is no supply chain. There is no value chain. People don't understand it. Well, isn't that really exciting? I mean, look at the opportunity. You know, provided we don't do this as and, I, and everything you have said is about is about stewardship of what we're doing. We can no longer, I think, as uh, as intelligent, sentient beings, 
uh, you know, just forget about, as you said, you know, just forget about the nostalgic, look, doing everything today with nostalgic look back. I, you know, absolutely praise that phrase from you. Um, so the question, your final uh, sort of piece was, Phew, Alan, what will you be doing in five years time? What job will you be doing? <laughs> <laughs> the same one where do you think you live so in other words, this is about how much will you achieve and how much how will you know you've achieved you know that's five years that's that that's huge time and given the every every quarter of a year there's amazing technologies there are amazing things happen in the space domain so five um, years century right so yeah. give us it what's your view five years time it's what are you doing it's a question I have to admit I asked perhaps unfairly of the defense community at the launch of the defense space strategy on the 1st of February. You know, how, how do you see this happening in 10 years time? Uh, and that's why I felt that I needed to respond to it myself in terms of five years time. So thank you. Um, yes, it's um, think as we've identified, there's an awful lot of, of, of stuff that needs to be done, um, including breakthroughs when we get to launch. How do we still get to launch? So there's still a lot of work being done with the Civil Aviation Authority on the license approach. How do we get our license? How do we prove launch heritage? These kind of challenges. I suppose in the first instance, the, the, the challenges at the very top of, uh, of the agenda for me, I would summarize as four market failures. Um, uh, again, broadly, and, and again, it's a topic that could be, I can debate for hours and hours and hours, but, um, you know, investing into space. There was an article just today in the Financial Times saying there's not going to be a headlong rush into investing into space. And yet at the same time, there are some outstanding companies out there, including Scottish companies who relatively recently got listed um, and took advantage of uh, SPACs, etc. So we do believe that there's still a, a disjointed approach to financing. We believe there's still a, a, an opportunity around infrastructure. Obviously, the, the spaceports are still being built or in construction. We do believe there are some challenges around the skills agenda, which is something we're still trying to address yeah. and articulate what that means in our own way. So again, it's engineering. Why is it that Skyrora can't, for example, employ the aerospace engineers who were laid off at the beginning of COVID? You know, and the simple answer to the question is because we don't know how to, because we think the skills are slightly different. We've begun to articulate what that skill set is and how that maps against those aerospace engineers who are is a resource, particularly in Scotland. And that's an aspiration we have. Uh, and the final one, as we said, is the regulatory. So it's the, the CAA thing. So the, these are the four areas which are really much uh, spend a lot of time a lot of focus on trying to trying to uh, solve in the prism of the environment in the prism of these responsibility stuff that we've been talking about um, I think uh, to be perfectly honest with you, there's more than adequate <laughs> work to be going getting on with for the next five years in, in in all of that area I would hope that again as I think you probably identified from the way I described it that the the aspiration the really my, my area of interest lies in the diplomacy and the legal legal uh, strategic capability that the UK has with space and in particular in the discussions that we started around the responsibility of how how a nation how a how a sector how a space industry can demonstrate and manifest its responsibility whether that's through again uh, societal norms whether that's through you know again soft regulation soft power soft influencing and actually trying to achieve that alignment that um, that, that that is required again because as we said uh, again at the very beginning Beginning, you know, if, if space, in order for space to be effective for humankind, we need to do it all together. It needs to be aligned. It needs to be efficient, and, and it is a, it a great driver of efficiency. It's a great catalyst of getting, of joining those dots and making it happen. So I believe that, yeah, for, for as long as, as you said, with a man on a mission, I've, you know, for as long as I, I pursue that that strategic goal, goal that strategic vision, I think you know, I've still got plenty to do in the next five years. Um, uh, um, and, and I'm sure that, the, the, you know, uh, everyone, everyone will agree on that front. Um, so I'm highly, highly motivated to keep pushing on that front. And again, I do believe that we, we in the UK have enormous opportunity to take this to the next level and really be proud of ourselves. So again, and it's, it's allowing us to be proud of what we can achieve with engineering capabilities and with, with all the other elements that we are doing exceedingly well today and gaining recognition for that. So that, I suppose and, that's the, sorry, go on. <laughs> sorry, that's this you're gonna do, but I was just gonna say, but also, you know, I mean, you've got, you've got some partnerships with Germany, you're talking to, you know, it's, it's, it's about Europe, it's about the world, it's about, as you said, it's about togetherness and doing this. So it's, yes, opportunity for Britain, but I think 
in that whole you know international and space as an environment where you really must would you agree with that alan i yep completely yes wholesale <laughs> <laughs> wholesale but togetherness in fact it was it was my kind of line in the uh in the uh, please look up thing uh, you know that uh we ain't you know the, this sort of my project my project to the moon or my project to whatever there there's you know it's 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 not an ideal route for this at all now there are lots of questions and torsten's offering that he'll step in probably to give me a bit of a break because i'm trying to keep the conversation going and read. And there's two, because people are putting stuff into the chat, which is really interesting. And Tom has, has asked a couple of things. And uh, so I'm going to let Torsten pull these out because I haven't got my glasses on. So I have to squint at them as well. <laughs> so I'm too vain to put my specs on uh, to see what that is. But look, I think man with a mission, but something that I think we've all learned, just we'll come back to this. But I think, you know, it's um, you're informed, you you grasp the science, the, the you know, it's very, very broad. And I think, you know, I was looking at, human capabilities you know you can talk eloquently about the science as well as the politics as well as the the legal at the framework so what does that say you're not a focused one one you know one one um one trot pony kind of uh, person and um and i think also patience and persuasiveness are are like uh, clearly clear, clearly things that were on your cv when you applied for the job right <laughs> right we'll come back yeah torsten will hand it back to me before we go but i'm going to give it back over to torsten so that he can pull out some of those questions because he can read them better than i am <laughs> i do have my glasses on already yes <laughs> you're right um no uh before you give me then I, I mean thank you very much great talk i really enjoyed uh and, and enjoyed these thoughts there's so much more in to to dig or in, in in future conversations now i challenge you with giving me just a 15 second answer or yes and no answer otherwise you will hear this wonderful sound um and then we go one by one because all of them have their their, their beauty so tom is asking is skyrora doing anything to move forward towards reusable launch systems for the purpose of reducing the cost of kilogram per orbit or to orbit yeah. Yes, we have that as an ambition, um, but we're getting to commercial orbit. Sorry, commercial launch in the first instance. So we're not we're not um, let's say investing money into that uh, as part of our initial. We want to get to launch first, and then and then to then follow up with the reusability side of things. Perfect, thank you. So, Mark Arthur, um, do you see the UK EU market staying focused on the CubeSat size products? As the on orbit per kilogram costs drop, won't we see the market drive towards or more towards the ESPA class sizing of bus? Um, I think, yes, the UK probably, uh, as with our, our uh, evaluation of the launch market, we think that the satellite market is still very quite uh, specific and tailored and good at specialities. Uh, and we think that that will continue. Uh, we again, with our launch offering, we're hoping to fuel that continued continuity. So actually, towards more niche or more diversified uh, small sat cube side satellites. Um, uh, we can't not look at larger launch, but um, again, we're very much focused on trying on on low Earth orbit and small launch. Perfect. Uh, Ramesh Kumar asks, what is the specific impulse for the hydrogen peroxide kerosene system i'm sorry i can't i'm not I the can't. engineer i'm sorry i don't have that number sorry <laughs> so it's 42 okay <laughs> we go with that um Ramesh, sorry for that um then roderick uh asks when we see or when do you hope to go to orbit our aspiration is for the quarter four uh, this year, quarter one next year, it depends on the license application processing and uh, and us hoping that we can get our engineering finalized uh, all by then. But we're we're well on our way. Didn't, uh, didn't other UK companies just got licenses, but different topics? No, no, no one's been uh, issued with a license. They've submitted. Okay, fair point. Mark Arthur again, regarding lower uh, G launch, does that mean Skyrora does not need the ECSS vibration profile from the satellite providers for uh, qualification levels. 
Wonderful. That's question. something. Yeah, I love it. We're, we're we're looking into this actively at the moment um, because it's one thing that's come up with a particular uh, a discussion that we're having. Yes, we do. Uh, we do obviously adhere to the ECS um, standards and uh, etc. And are very much aware of them. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the what the the the, the sort of specific answer, but yes, we are. We do think that this is going to set us aside. Great. And so the last question here, uh, you can get uh, a few more seconds for the, for the answer because it's an how question from Elise. Uh, so how do you see the collaboration between Skyrora and the other Scottish space firms working to address the rapidly increasing demand for small uh, satellite launch vehicles in Scotland and the UK? Well, that's uh, that's my question. I, <laughs> it's precisely so, it's. But you have it, just thirty seconds. <laughs> it's uh, the oh, thank you. The thirty seconds, the thirty seconds are uh, we are spending a lot of time as uh, an industry, particularly with the spaceports, trying to get a, attention of Westminster to the detail of what it is we are doing. We believe that the uh, again, as witnessed by the market research that was undertaken by Highlands and Islands Enterprise, uh, space tech partners there is a very compelling opportunity for launch and what that will mean in terms of launch revenue, in terms of launch, uh, spaceport revenue and absolute and, and top line in terms of jobs, which is the economic side upside of making launch happen. So we spend a lot of time trying to go align this message with other, uh, other immediate launch uh, infrastructure uh, partners and trying to push that. At the same time, we are pulling in satellite collaborators to again, to allow us to get to fever pitch with this discussion. Because part of the problem that we've got, we, we perceive is that Westminster has thinks it's done launch because it has, uh, let's say two service providers, which we believe are not actually based in the UK. Um, we think that the economic opportunity needs to be the main driver rather than the one-off launch that uh, which is being offered uh, as a kind of like a again a government solution to to answer their commitment to launch uh, and that's the case we're very much looking to put on the table and to live with the government that's the challenge thank you perfect oh, almost 30 boom. seconds boom the last the last message came right across so it's back over to me and i think that is that is really the point yes we can do some stuff to get this thing the whole you know british uh, scottish british uh, space uh, space launch space ports get it kick started but then there's a hell of a lot of capability here that needs to be aligned value chain set up lots of business communication lots of opportunities opportunities to partner with people all over the world europe us whatever all these markets you've talked about the people have alluded to in the in the in the chat you know, and, and the capability, you know, but let's do it with stewardship. Let's do it carefully. We're not bonkers human beings just creating a bigger problem for someone tomorrow, because I don't think there's going to be many tomorrows if we do. So, Alan, I think I've said it and I'll say it again. You know, I think that standing your 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 human approach to to these problems, your ability to persuade. I, I'm really pleased we've got someone like you in that seat that, you know, in that seat. Um, and uh, and doing that on behalf of um, of everyone, because you don't just do those conversations with the British government, but they will impact others because it it has to. You're talking about the law. You're talking about setting regulations, setting standards. So congratulations for all of that, and thank you for sharing that with us. Man with a mission, man with patience, man with persuasion, and all the rest. So really, really delighted at that. With that, I thank everybody who's been, you know, everybody who's been putting in questions. They've been, you know, they've brought out aspects of Skyrora that I didn't know, and I, you know, and I know Alan well, and, and I've been watching it carefully. So, um, but I will say one thing before I hand over. People, if you enjoy these, if you enjoy these, um, you know, the Space Watch Global, the whole, this independent um, um, journalism that they provide, please sponsor them, you know. Our company sponsors them. Um, we're not a king size company, so there is an opportunity to do that. Please do it because it's um, it will allow them to do even more and even better. So back to you, Torsten, to do the wind up. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you uh, to, to point it out, um, Angela. So our next Space Cafe Scotland uh, will be somewhere in April. In April. That's 
how close we can get at the moment uh we will let you know are uh, in the next days so but there will be a new one that's a message here um our next events and please uh, stay with us for 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 a mo moment because this lineup is absolutely incredible and it touches on a number of points that that alan already raised so Next Tuesday, in my 33 minutes, I will talk with Anna Christmann, who is the new German aerospace coordinator. She's for six weeks in the in the office now, and I have the great pleasure to talk with her about the outcomes from the German perspective of the EU su Space Summit held uh, Wednesday this week in Toulouse. Then, two days later, on the 24th, we have our first Space Cafe Austria by uh, Judith Delaney, uh, and she will talk with Andrea Kleinsasser, also from the Austrian government, about Austrian's work as UN, uh, at UN Copius. One day later, on the 25th, we are going to Canada with uh, the wonderful Dr. Jessica West, and she will talk with Paul um, Myers, our ambassador in, in, our, in, uh, at the UN for Canada for a while, and one of the biggest singers in the uh, uh, disarmament world or uh, in space. So, uh, the week after, I have uh, the great pleasure to talk with Emmanuel and uh, Minou of, uh, from the space or about the space security rating. Also, one thing um, Alan pointed to. And uh, on Friday of this week, on the 4th of March, Chiara and Banu will have their next Space Cafe banner looks. So that's on our list for the next two weeks. Uh, I think that's super exciting. So all these events will be or are already on Eventbrite. Um, so as always, we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook or on LinkedIn. And thank you very much, Alan and uh, Angela, of course, for this inspi inspiring talk and our Alan for being our guest. Hope you will stay safe and uh, stay healthy, all of you, and thanks and overcoming the storm. So we are waiting for it. This night it will hit, hit us here in Northern Germany. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Hope to see you next week and in the meantime. Just, someone's just asking, yes, it will be uploaded online. All of Space Watch uh, are, are uploaded online, right? So... Yes, 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 yes. You will receive our thank you email in the next hour and then as soon as we have the video ready, uh, you will get another email with a link to the recap and then that includes the video. So yes, everything will be online and we have an extensive archive on our website Absolutely. already about the 200 plus space cafes that we had. So including the five Scottish ones. So again, thanks for joining. And Thank as I always all. say, don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you. Thank you.